Hi guys, David, Hamble Trekker Channel. How are you doing today? I'm going to be starting a new mini series. I'm not sure how many episodes it's going to be, but what I want to do in it is go through the history of some classic knives and then test a whatever you can get on a budget as a modern version of that classic knife. So today I'm going to be kicking off the series with a look at the uh, the K Bar Marine fighting knife. If you'd found yourself in the United States Marine Corps um, in the early parts of uh, World War II, into 42, 1942, you would have been equipped with a mismatch of uh, fighting knives and also utility knives. If you were issued a fighting knife, you might have been given uh, a World War I era brass handled trench knife and they didn't have a specific knife, fighting knife. If you were a rifleman, you would of course have had a, a bayonet. Not as very, not perfect for close hand around hand combat, a little bit too heavy, uh, unwieldy. They did have a version of uh, a double-sided dagger for silent assassination, modeled of after the, uh, the British Fairbairn Sykes. And this was issued to troops who were expected to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat not generally issued, but it was found that being a double-edged, slim, dagger-type knife, it was also, of course, used for other functional work, opening up ration cans, opening up crates, and so on and so forth. And for that, it was too light duty. So in 42, the US Marine Corps, they uh, put out a request for a new fighting knife, which could be issued to many troops and be mass-produced. They were after a knife that could be cheaply manufactured, both cheap to manufacture in terms of labour, i.e. easy to manufacture, fast manufacture, and also not using expensive materials or materials that were key to other more important areas of the war, aircraft manufacture, for example. And they wanted it to be a fighting knife, but also with the understanding that the, the average guy in the field is going to use it for practical tasks, as mentioned, opening up. Uh, ammo boxes, open up general stores crates, opening up your rations, cutting branches, digging holes, latrine holes, and so on and so forth. So in '42, they did actually adopt the design, the which has become known as the United States Marine Corps fighting knife, the K-Bar. It began to become issued in early '43. Uh, first, just to the elite troops, uh, the commando types, the power troops. Uh, then it was began to become issued to all troops that didn't weren't riflemen, so they didn't have a a bayonet. And then by the end of the war, as I understand it, basically anybody that was in the United States Marine Corps got a cable. So the United States Marine Corps they wanted a strong, multi-purpose, cheap to manufacture knife, uh, good for combat but good for functional tasks too. And this is what they ended up with: the classic cable fighting knife. Its overall length 12 inches, the blade length 7 inches uh, clip point, handguard and the stacked leather handle with five grooves in it and pommel. Originally the pommels early days they were screwed on this was found to be not strong enough so ever since then they've become pinned or uh, riveted in place one way or another. You can actually see the tang in this version coming through the end. So this is the classic K-Bar knife and it's been manufactured by a whole bunch of companies through the years but they've all followed this design made of 1095 carbon steel. One of the big features of the K-Bar which makes it recognisable is the stacked leather handle with the five grooves. The stacked leather, this is actually a leather handle, it's rings of leather um, inserted onto the tank and then shaped, sanded, uh, shaved into shape to look like this. It's lightweight, it gives you good grip even in wet conditions and the lightness of the handle helps with the, the speed. The shape of the handle helps with being able to grip the, the knife and still be usable and comfortable in any type of dimension, any direction, so standard grip reverse grip and it's a very lightweight for its size knife 
which gives it the ability to move fast in the hand. During the war, the knife was manufactured by several different manufacturers, and I've made a note here to get it right. It was made by the Camillus Company, it was made by the Union Cutlery Company, and the Union Cutlery Company later changed its name to the K-Bar Company. It was manufactured by the Robson or Robson Cut Cutlery Company and also the Powell Cutlery Company or P-A-L Cutlery Company. So there you go. After the war, it was continued to be manufactured by even more companies. Again, I've made a note, the Utica Company, the Cornell Company, Camillus continued to manufacture it. And then in 1980, the Ontario Knife Company began to manufacture it and supply it to the US military. And this is actually an Ontario version of the knife. The Ontario 498 is very true to the original dimensions and specs of the knife. It's made out of 1095 steel. It's got a zinc phosphate black coating on the blade to protect the blade from corrosion and also to keep it uh, low profile. And on the stack leather handles, they've actually painted them with some material, not sure what, to basically protect the leather. Obviously, my opinion of this knife is not super important, right guys? This is a knife that is, what can it be, 70, 70 years old now, 80 years old even maybe, and it's been produced in the millions, the millions and millions, it's been used by millions and millions of people around the world, it's still being produced today, exactly the same, was it, what, same way it was in 1943. Uh, it's a classic knife, what I like about it is the shape. For me, this is the quintessential look of a knife. I mean, it's strong, but everything about it is a compromise. It was a compromise when it was produced, right? They wanted a fighting knife, but they also wanted a knife that people were gonna use for utility. So, if you want to sneak up behind somebody and do a, be a silent assassin, it's gonna do that. If you need it to stick in a tree trunk like this, like I'm doing, or open a crate, it's gonna do that too. If you need to remove a few branches of a dead tree like this, it's gonna do that too. It's just a damn good all-round servant. You can make fires with it. Let's make a fire with it now. This type of soil can, when you create a fire on it, you can actually create an underground fire. The roots, the organic material under the ground can start burning unnoticed actually you can think you've extinguished it and it'll continue to burn for days potentially afterwards thereby creating the risk of a fire fire so it's important to take all precautions to avoid that so don't bur burn directly on the ground and it's extinguish it with a very large amount of water The Ontario incarnation of this knife. Uh, Ontario have been making it for the US military since 1980. Not sure if they still do, but it's a genuine K bar. Um, and the best thing about it, it's made in the USA and it's a pretty good price point too. Fantastic. If you're going to get the K bar right, you've got to get one that's made in the USA by a company that's been doing it for the military for decades now. So why is it called a K-bar? Well, the story goes like this. There was a guy, he was a fur trapper, and um, he got attacked by a bear in the 1920s, and he wrote a letter to a knife manufacturing company, and which manufacturing company it was? The company that's now called K-bar, so the Union Company. Uh, I'll double check that, I'll put it on the screen if I got it wrong, if the memory does, fails me. But so he wrote a, a letter to the Union Company back in the 1920s, and something had gone wrong with the letter, it had faded or it had got damaged in some way and where he'd wrote in I used my knife to kill a bear the only part that was visible was the words K-A-B-A-R 
So after that, they said their knives were good enough to kill a bear and they became, this seems really confusing to me, but it became known as K-Bar. And that's got something to do with this trapper killing a bear. Bear in mind in the 1920s, that wasn't this knife. This knife wasn't designed until 1940s. But you can see this knife has got a heritage going back for, you know, from the, to the 19th century um, bow, Bowie or Bowie style knife. So the Bowie knives look like this. They're normally a bit scaled up from this, but you can get smaller Bowies to bow, Bowies too. Uh, so this is like a, a Bowie knife. So it's got that tradition from the, for me anyway, from the, the Western area era through the uh, those terrible dark days of the 1940s and it's just for me it looks like if i had to draw a knife or if you're like a five-year-old and you draw a knife this is the knife you draw and that kind of like uh, enthusiasm sticks with a lot of people it stuck with me and that's why i love the k-bar thanks for watching guys until the next time take it easy get down in the comment section and give me your stories of the k-bar because I know everybody out there, or well, many people out there, have a story of the K-Bar, a love affair with the K-Bar. And it's really interesting for me to read everybody's stories about these classic knives. Take it easy.